Constance Stelz Müller, okay, everybody's come out of watching Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, uh, speaking on this flying visit out of Ukraine at this intense moment of crisis. What's your takeaway from his speech? Well, I mean, you will have noticed, um, everybody noticed, he got standing ovations at the beginning at the end. Um, and I think that's um, in recognition that he is a young leader um, still untrained in many ways, but leading a country at a historically difficult time in great danger. And I think everybody in the room and beyond it recognizes that that's a danger that is for him personally, for the people of his country, for the future of Ukraine, but really also for the future of the European security order. So there is, I think, you know, beyond the criticism that you might have had of his performance or his speech, was a recognition that this is all bigger than we are and that we're in it together. Yeah, I mean, I think you, everybody can't help but notice this courage uh, of the, in this situation, especially given, I mean, he, he was a comedian until not very long ago. Um, and yet he came really with specific demands. I mean, he was saying, guys, it's nice to have your applause, but we want this, this and this, right? Yes, he is preternaturally collected, which is really quite something. But I, maybe that also comes with having done stand-up comedy. I think you need to be able to, to do that if you, if you want to survive as a comedian. That said, um, I think that the Ukrainians do themselves the least favors when they come with demands that are just factually difficult for their Western interlocutors uh, to, to accede to. And uh, he, he said, you know, we need a date for EU membership. That's just not going to happen in the same way that it's not going to happen with Turkey. Um, whereas if you, it would be, I think, much more well received and much more practical of him, much more operational, if he said, we know we're not going to become members, but we, are, we have uh, five ideas on how we might become more integrated into the European economic space. And, in, and where you could then help us with economic, um, ecological and democratic transformation. One thing to keep in mind here, I would remind you, and I, actually I'm saying that because somebody else just reminded me who's an expert on this, which I am not, which is that Ukraine is one of the largest grain providers in the world. And that um, also we actually have an economic interest in, in helping Ukraine continue to export its agricultural products um, to Europe. Um, there were some other calls, though. I mean, he didn't mention Germany by name, but implicitly sort of once again throwing down the gauntlet to Germany to, to do something on the arms exports. That really doesn't seem likely, does it? Or do you, do you have any, do you see any scenario in which uh, the German position on that changes? So I personally disagree with the German position. And for a long time, I didn't. Under current circumstances, I, I think that the arguments for giving them um, the means of self-defense far outweigh the arguments against. But I think let's not get into that here. The German position is, is very simply that the center-left parties have always tried to reduce Germany's role as one of the biggest arms exporters in the world. Right? The dirty little secret of that, by the way, is that those arms exports also keep unit prices down for the, Ger the, the German armed forces. Right? Um, so we benefit from that apart from the profits. Um, but I think that if there is you know, further Russian aggression, and, and let's keep in mind here that threats are, are their own form of aggression, marching up to Ukraine's border with more than 100,000 troops, making intransigent demands, not responding to perfectly reasonable offers of, of negotiations that the West has put forth, all of that is already a form of aggression. We're not in peace right now. We're in a sub-war state, but it's really bad enough. Um, and, and there I think um, we might, if that spills over into actual military violence, if there are uh, civilian deaths and on a large scale, I do not see how that German restraint holds up. Now, your job is, of course, watching transatlantic relations, particularly uh, Germany-US relations. 
This was a really interesting couple of days from that point of view as well. We had the new government, Olaf Scholz and Annalena Baerbock, the Chancellor and uh, the Foreign Minister having their debuts on this kind of stage. Kamala Harris, also the US uh, Vice President speaking. Can we maybe just talk about a couple of those uh, debuts? Like, first of all, Olaf Scholz, he was speaking earlier Saturday. What was your takeaway from his speech? Did he make an impressive speech in your view? Well, I thought, I've been watching Olaf Scholz very carefully, as one does, um, with a new government. And it seems to me that we're seeing him on a, on a steep learning trajectory. Um, when he was in Washington um, two weeks ago, he was... I thought very wooden, particularly in the press conference with President Biden, where the president was being Irish Catholic and effusive and saying we utterly, totally, completely, you know, rely on Germany. And the chancellor sort of in a slightly thin lip way said, yeah, and we pay a lot of money to Ukraine. Uh, that I thought was, you know, just emotionally inadequate as a response. Um, and the other thing that I thought was even more serious uh, that was missing for a long time from the way the chancellor was framing his policy position was that he wasn't embedding it in a larger strategic narrative of what all this is about. And you could see here in this, in this speech that he's beginning to do that. He started out with a very strong framing about um, democracies having to stand up to authoritarian powers who are undermining, you know, not just the security of, of one country that's not an EU or NATO member, Ukraine, but really questioning the entirety of the uh, international, the European security order and the principles of international law, like sovereignty, um, you know, non, non-intervention you know, in, in other people's countries. Yeah, that also struck me that that was, it seemed to be the sort of strongest sort of language about democracy that we've heard from Olaf Scholz so far. But at the same time, and he's on the record of this, on this very strongly, is he's very much resistant to the idea of getting sucked into some kind of new Cold War scenario uh, between the US and China. Uh, he once again repeated that he doesn't want to see any sort of decoupling, you know, this term of, of sort of any kind of sort of drawing apart between the US and China. So how does he square on the one hand talking about, yeah, we need to fight back as democracies, plus on the other hand trying to say, well, we don't want to get caught into some kind of ideological um, kind of contest long term? You know, I think that's probably not resolvable for anybody because um, in the, the truth is that um, Germany on its own is a middle power, very much exposed uh, and dependent upon for to America for security, uh, to the Russians for energy, and to the Chinese for trade. I mean, much of the German trade miracle of the of the prosperity miracle of the past ten years has been due to its massive trade expansion with China. Of course, that has a political impact, um, and we are only you know very slowly figuring out how to unpick those tentacles and how to make sure that um, you know that we maintain certain relationships but do not expose ourselves to political blackmailing through them. I think that's possible, um, particularly if we are a little stricter about what we say allow the Chinese to buy in terms of assets um, and where we allow them to invest, for example. And Huawei, the Huawei um, 5G network was a case in point where I think opinions have changed quite sharply, not least because of the way that China has been behaving in Europe and in Germany and the sort of increasingly bullying tone of their, of their presence in Europe. But it took a while, and, and you can see the Chancellor, and I, I mean, I, I actually think that that's okay. You can see the Chancellor trying to balance out a sort of reasonable pragmatism with, with saying, but yes, we have strict red lines, and if you cross those, um, the relationship will change quite drastically. Um, but yeah, I mean, Scholz got quite a bit of criticism after this visit to Biden just recently. Um, what's your sense after seeing his performance this weekend in Munich? Uh, do you think the administration is going to be looking at him a bit more warmly? Well, let's not forget that between the visit in Washington and the speech here lies the visit to Moscow, um, where where I think people were quite anxious, you know, that he would be lied to or bullied or you know generally sort of humiliated. And and actually that didn't happen. He held his own. Uh, and in fact, he made a sort of a little quip about Putin, you know, deciding how long he would stay in office. But presumably that would end some time too as well, but would be longer than his tenure, which was tantamount to telling Putin, you're a dictator, but even your time will end sometime. I don't, you know, I haven't seen anybody do that in my memory. 
So what I'm trying to say is that you can you can see between Washington and Moscow and, and here in Munich, you can see a sort of trajectory of increasing self-confidence and an increasing willingness to embed sort of policy points and, and his habitual Cajunness and caution into a larger sort of strategic narrative. What the thing that I think we should also point out is that he was very um, very insistent on the need for European sovereignty. Um, which, but, but a European sovereignty that doesn't see itself as an alternate to the relationship with America or, or the relationship with NATO, but rather strengthens Europe's position because we act as a bloc vis-a-vis uh, -vis authoritarian great powers. That, I think, is, a very, is very important for him to say because it ultimately also means that the Germans don't get to you know, develop these relationships bilaterally, which is really the cause of the energy dependency with Russia and the cause um, of our sort of really very, uh, very quite weak position vis-a-vis -vis China. So in essence, you, European sovereignty, if we take it seriously, means, all right, we're going to bring ourselves into alignment uh, with the rest of Europe, even if that costs us. That's important. And the current crisis is underlined like, I mean, nothing that I can remember in many years, just how dependent Europe is on American security at the moment. I mean, the, uh, I mean it's, it's total. Well, you know, yes and no. Uh, again, you know, this is not a binary. Um, it's particularly because what the Russians have been doing, when I said that their threats are a form of aggression, um, basically the Russians are using military means to achieve political results, right? Um, which would be very economical of them, very elegant if it works out. I, I think it carries with, with it uh, the significant risk of miscalculation, accidental escalation, and people calling your bluff. All of that could happen in the next 48 hours, we don't know. But um, while it is correct that we are in no way uh, able to compete with America in terms of military might, um, it is also the case that the reason the Americans are hugging us the way they are strategically in this current moment is that they have understood that the strongest weapon the alliance has vis-a-vis -vis Russia, a deterrent weapon, is, is our economic and political cohesion and our willingness to impose costs on Russia which are also costs upon ourselves. And that's where the EU comes in. That's where the European Union as a single market space comes in. Um, and I understand from journalist friends in Moscow that, that the Kremlin is actually quite genuinely worried about this. And that's really important. Let's just talk about Annalena Baerbock briefly. So um, she's had her debut here as well. Uh, she's been very much on the world stage, just like Olaf Scholz. Um, you also had an extended conversation with her last night. Um, it struck me that in her appearance with Tony Blinken, her American counterpart, just how close they are uh, on almost everything they were talking about. Uh, did that strike you as well? And what's your kind of rating of her so far? Right. So, um, yes, I thought it was very much in evidence when the two of them were on the stage yesterday that they sort of enjoy a sort of mutual report, um, that they get each other. Uh, and there was, I think, a degree of warmth there and also a sense that, people, you know, that you were, they were generally in, this, in the same sort of analytical framework, which is you know, good. I mean, it's, it's been otherwise. Yeah, I mean, when did that last happen between Germany and the US? Absolutely. So that's really important. And I will say, having, having had her, you know, and been given the opportunity to engage her in conversation, which was a first for me as well, I thought, um, you know, why she, she's clearly also still on a learning curve in terms of sort of very specific points of policy and the arguments and counter arguments, which is normal. Um, she's immensely engaging. She has enormous charisma um, and manages to come off at the same time as completely authentic. Somebody who really can get the uh, attention of an entire room, um, which then watches her think, think things through. Yeah? And that may be you know, n not perfect in its articulation, but it is immensely appealing because it's, because it's, so, um, because it's so honest. And so, uh, and I've also talked to a number of people who have met with her, you know, in a, in a sort of formal way and who were also really taken with her and said, um, you know, this is, this is really, really good news. 
So someone to watch, uh, Annalena Baerbock, the new foreign minister. Um, this has partly been a kind of an echo chamber, this conference, because we haven't had the Russians here to kind of give their, their sense of the view. But there was an intervention by Wang Yi, the, the Chinese foreign minister, uh, earlier today. And he had a kind of a double-edged message. Uh, up front, he was basically supporting Russia on its demands against uh, NATO expansion. Uh, but when questioned uh, by Wolfgang Ischinger, the chairman of the conference, uh, Wang Yi did acknowledge that um, the idea of territorial integrity, which China is committed to in international relations, that that also applies to Ukraine. So how do you, what's your takeaway from that? Where, where is China positioning itself on this whole crisis? This is interesting in several ways. One, um, I'm told by people who know more about this than I do, that Wang Yi is in a similar position to the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, which is that essentially he doesn't call the shots. You know, he, he is sent to go through the motions, but the talking points come from elsewhere um, because power is verticalized and centralized, uh, centralized in both countries. Um, that said, um, you know, again, there are talking points and he was executing them faithfully. And I thought it was notable that compared to the sort of very pro-Russian tone of the paper that, the, that Beijing and Moscow signed recently, um, he was being really very circumspect in talking about the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And, and, I, and I thought you could sense that this is a conundrum for the Chinese, uh, where they are not entirely certain that what the Russians are currently doing is really in their national interest. Um, so maybe just to, to finish up, um, there's been all this talking over the last couple of days about this crisis, totally dominated. Has the talk here, has the diplomatic in interventions here, have they changed anything about the dynamic of the crisis uh, at the moment, do you think? I don't think so, because there, I don't think we've seen anything, you know, where that sort of made, you know, Im impel compelled some sort of policy shift, right? Um, but I think it is in a situation like this, where people have been um, working from home for two years, um, have been, um, you know, conducting really very complex policy negotiations online, you know, because they had to. Um, it was, I think, important and, and sort of heartwarming, really, to see people in person and to, and to realize that politics in the end is also about people sort of getting each other, you know. I mean, the virtual formats have been very productive in, in ways that were unexpected. But I think there can be no international diplomacy without human contact and, and, you know, people feel that here. So I think there's also a sense of warmth and relief, which is very real. Thanks so much, Constance Schelsman. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on.